I, I do think I've now let's get Mike got on more familiar with this paper. Yeah, let's get him. We'll get him on here. So, yeah, so we, we, are we, we are live. We we are live. Okay, well, cheers. So there's, I wanted to here. chat. First thing I wanted to chat about was who's got, well, and I'm going to throw this out to the audience because now we've, we've turned on comments, but I want to know who you think's got the right. better hair. Is it Toby or Corey <laughs> or Wes? Wes. Wes? I'm going to throw Wes in there too. There's, um, there's, Wes has got the smallest the hair statement. for, for yeah. coronavirus yeah. shutdown. Yeah. I got efficient haircut. That is I got, true. I just let it go, oh, man. I just don't the efficiency. You got to shave it every day. The density and luster Look of that hair, that. you know, it's it does. It's got the same kind of waviness as, as Corey's. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think you've got better beard density than Corey. Oh, it's, so it's a bit patchy. That's 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 <laughs> that's, that's man bun esque. There, you could do a bun in the top and the mid back. Yeah, you know, no, you're true. you're solid. You're so the ladies are gonna like like that. I, think. I can't fight well enough to to put a man bun on. <laughs> I get your sword. We'll get you a broadsword. Get you a broadsword and a shield, and away you go. You're good to go. <laughs> Some spike leather this armor. Is, this is what happy hours like. Cheers, gentlemen. It's been too yep. long. Cheers. 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 I'm going with a uh, margarita today with the uh, tequila trombra. And nice. uh, what, what else we got on the call here? A little Moscow mule. Thanks for my. In the yeah, proper the mint on top, proper and mug I, too. And a copper, I got yeah. you. and I got some mint little, on your suggestion, brother. I'm in a little little um, bar into the background, so it sounds like we're at the. I'm D and T made by my mother-in-law. Ooh, <laughs> classic. There and you're classic. Night in here, you never know. Yeah, uh, you in our mother-in-law's in basement right now. Uh, I'm I'm in there. I'm in my father-in-law's like workroom right now. It's my. Uh, what brought you there? Uh, what brought me here was 100 mile hour winds and oak trees that destroyed everything around my house, including the power. So I get to hang out in Jersey now. As if you oh, don't have enough going on down there. So yeah. you know what? We, guys, before we go any further, we yeah, forgot. We don't we have to record this locally? I, now we've forgotten. So we're going to have yeah. to start. Everyone oh, press uh, record I'm, on some sort of local. Uh, I'm recording. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've been recording. Since ah, see the pros. Look at you, you guys. Oh, that's weak. <laughs> we got distracted. So weak. I, I didn't record any of the drinking stuff. At the I'm beginning. starting now. I blame the fact that I've been drinking for now. <laughs> so right. So so you guys listening later have missed the hair debate. Um, so which is probably going to be the best part of this discussion. Um, so that's a lesson. You guys need to turn tune in live next time, or you, you miss the best parts. Um, hair though. Keep talking about hair for a bit. <laughs> Out I'm drinking house. a local brew, uh, uh, Flying Monkeys, 12 Minutes to Destiny. It's a raspberry hibiscus lager that my wife bought, and it's actually fantastic. It's a bit of a departure wow. from my usual, but it's it's good. It's, it's apropos. It's, light. it's 12 monkeys. I'm impressed you were prepared to say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> say that publicly. I debated it. <laughs> I debated I, it. I, I got an even worse one. This is a I'm virgin alive. gunfire. <laughs> Which means that it's it's just coffee. It's literally there's no alcohol. Virgin gunfire. You, you guys know gunfire? No. That's what they, they they used to drink at Gallipoli. It's just rum in in coffee. They drink Ooh. it every year in celebration. Uh, uh, but I've got no rum in mine. <laughs> Dude, Adam, that painting back there in on your bottom shoulder. I have that. I think the same painting. My grand, my late grandmother had that. What what is that? That um, is a tie rubbing. Um, okay. No, no pun intended. Uh, yeah. So it's. <laughs> I bet you so were shocked when you got a painting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh, uh, so yeah. So the monks rub this on a special kind of paper with charcoal okay. and it creates the design. And I don't know if you knew this, but I, my wife and I lived in Thailand for a couple of years, and so we brought back a bunch of this stuff. But uh, this actually yeah. isn't for me. It's my. Father-in-law got this uh, on his pilgrimage to Thailand when he was uh, a younger man and didn't have room for it, so so gave it to me. And nice yeah. reminder of time spent in Asia, which is was a really great time in my life. So you, yours was? Do you have it? Did you inherit it, or is it still your grandmother's? It's hanging in my house, and I'm gonna take a picture of it and send it to you. Like I'm like I'm not in my house right now, but I, I'm thinking like, wow, like did Adam steal that when he was? 
you know, sleeping here last time or what? Because I've seen that. That's a pretty common Thai rubbing design. So I yeah, yeah, really 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 made it to Thailand, got one of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you enough. what would really blow your mind is uh, in my living room, I've got a painting. And I learned later that this is like the, you know, animal cruelty on steroids. So now I'm, mm -hmm. I'm all ashamed of it. But, but yeah, you know, notwithstanding that in my living room, I've got a, a painting that was done by an elephant. And it's a painting wow. of an elephant, like in the sunset. And this elephant actually painted this from this Thai elephant um, shelter in Northern Thailand. How much, how much did you, you pay know, so, that? Oh, like, I don't know, 400 baht, which is like 50 bucks or something. Um, another, so another not, not a lot, but. Some dude dressed up as, a, as an elephant. Well, I watched them paint it. I literally mm -hmm. watched the elephant paint it. It was, it was. I've never seen anything like it. It was crazy. But anyways, they're, apparently their elephants are really not treated well. And so now I'm, speaking, I need to be ashamed of, of that. Deep value purchases. Um, why don't we get to the topic? <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was the topic. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm well, I actually, I want to make sure we start with that. Uh, while we're sort of off topic a little bit, I, I want to make sure we get the March of the Fallen update. Because I sure. do not want to miss uh, that or have that delayed. So, so what do you got for us, Wes? What's happening in that realm? Yeah, so I, I talked to the general the other day, General Gronsky. He was actually going to be on Jocko's podcast. If you guys know who Jocko is, of course, uh, so, who doesn't? Yeah, and he's going to uh, he's going to promote obviously the march for us as well. So this awesome. thing could get big. Um, so that that's good news. The the bad news is it's pretty likely that obviously this, we're going to have to you know, figure out our virtual, uh, a virtual version of the March this year. Um, unless something dramatic happens that that's, that's my, it's not a hundred percent, but I, I'd say that's probably likely because it's in late September, you know, arguably if this thing is real at all, it'll come back a little bit and they probably don't want a thousand people hanging out together. So unlike we're going to do it live, but, but, um, we're scheming on some other ideas on how to make it a virtual event and I'll, well, once we get some things fleshed out, I'll, uh, I'll ask you guys what you think. So awesome. it's, it's going. There's no excuse to not stay in shape, but uh, you may not have to do it in the middle of nowhere in Pennsylvania. Well, it's a good event. Like, it's a great excuse to get together, and I, we look yeah. forward to it every year. And uh, so that's a shame, and we'll have to figure out how to make the most of the remote experience. Um, you should randomize. To... You should Every half an hour, you randomize four people to do FaceTime with, with each other. While yeah, they hide yeah. locally, yeah, right. yeah, I like build, it. Uh, you're good. You guys are good at building apps in Alpha Architect. Go and build that app. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, we're gonna have to get a tech solution rocking. But uh, there is a chance it could go. Um, but like I said, it's, it's not looking great at this point. But uh, well, look, that's all I got for now. We're March shaming Toby here. You know, I mean, yeah, I'll I can do just it see him. Year. He's if just I don't have to travel. I'll do it. He's in California. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't come at northeast for any any of this we, stuff. We, we, well, look, if you can get Matt to anyway. come, yeah, we'll get oh, Toby. That's right, man. I was there last year. Yeah. You know, uh, I saw Hofstein did David Goggins. I think it was four by four by twenty four. You had to do four miles every four hours for twenty four hours, which meant you know. He, and the thing I asked him afterwards, how did it go? And he said, "Well, you got to do a lot of laundry because he just ran out of <laughs> ran out of marching and ran out of, ran out of clothes." But he got through it. What an animal. Yeah. And God forbid he'd have to wear the same piece of clothing yeah. twice in Corey too, right? <laughs> totally. yeah, not, not something I would have been uh, working out and sleeping, same clothes all the way through. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Just yeah. throw them away at the end. <laughs> so 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 value so, renaissance, guys. Oh, I mean, yeah. honestly, you guys the have gotta timing. be the timing feeling... could be better. The bottom's in, yeah. boys. It is God, nowhere so. but up from here. I'm so proud of you guys for making it through. Contrast well, how I'm you're sorry. feeling today to how you were feeling even two weeks ago. Yeah. Much, somebody's, much better. Somebody's <laughs> typing, is this the uh, Value Anonymous support group? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. having a few. <laughs> I mean, yep. my problem is uh, the, the beatdown has been so long and so painful at this point. Like, I'm just kind of numb to anything. So like, this is exciting, I guess, in theory, but you know, I, I just, I know, I just know it's gotta be fake. It and can't it's be real. It's two, it's two uh, weeks. Right? <laughs> I just gave up on value, but I'm still stick with it. Cause at this point I'm all in. So, you know, it's crazy. There's one last, 
Last year, we ran from August 27. There was that big move where it was like the six standard deviation. It's not normally distributed, so it's not. I know. Don't, don't tell me that afterwards. But <laughs> there was that gigantic move to value, gigantic move away from momentum. August 27 followed up. Sorry, August 27 was the bottom. It was September 9th. September 10 was like a five standard deviation day. Ran like a scalded cat all the way through to December 17. Just hit a brick wall. Just drifted sideways and down, which I think was the sell-off pre the COVID shutdown. And then shut the bed through. Uh, everybody knows that it got it got shot first. And then didn't recover at the other side. So anybody who's been trading value for the last decade has got scar tissue all over them. So there's no way in the world you trust two weeks of a little bit of a run. That's that's noise. Yeah, I don't know, man. A couple of weeks kind of ago, I'm not game. a value guy. And a couple We're of weeks ago, I decided to ever. buy some value stocks. I bought um, Jets. I don't know if you've heard it. But sure. um, like deep, deep value <laughs> stuff, like almost broke that value. It's paying off quite nicely. How, is it like up 80% or something in two weeks? I think like Robin, Robin Hood owns basically the whole thing. Like all the Robin Hood kids. You've got to give it to the Robin Hood guys, it. right? Because they have, they're either, I, I've been saying this a few times. There's, there's very little difference. If you're a dip buyer, you're either a value guy or a bag holder. And you don't really know until about a year after the event. But those Robin Hood guys, they're good. Dip buyers, at least. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was astounding. It For really now, they are. I mean, they're doing better than Buffett. So there, yeah. I, I, I'm He's a patient interested. man. What do you think? Because because I know, um, Toby, you've been kind of on the on the Berkshire bandwagon a little bit. It showed up in some of your screens. You were excited about about uh, sort of uh, getting an allocation to that, and then and then you know, so all the all the Warren wannabes, um, you know leaping ahead of Warren saying, hey, this has got to be the buying opportunity of a lifetime. By the time he reports, he's sold some banks, sold all his airlines and uh, not bought and, any stock and not bought a single. Yeah, not bought a, bought a few billion, but that's like not yeah. that much net net, a net seller. And so what are your what are your thoughts on there? How, how do you how do you sort of uh, encourage the, the the value zeitgeist to to continue to stay true? But, you know, What's Warren doing? How do you handle that whole discussion? Yeah, so on uh, March 23rd, which was the bottom for the market, but March 20, through that sort of week beforehand, uh, on a on a prior Q basis, the book value, price to book value for Berkshire was as cheap as it was March 5th, 2009. And then you got to go way back. I don't know that it was ever that cheap on a book value basis before. That's a very rare opportunity to buy it. And it got down to, I think, $162, 163 and it rallied like it's 180 something today. It's not not much higher. Like it rallied a little bit, and then it kind of fell over. I think part of it was that uh, Buffett's always very very optimistic. And then they did. He had that uh, annual meeting, which was spooky as hell because it was in the gigantic yeah. auditorium with nobody mm -hmm. there, and he was somber. Yeah, and probably appropriately so because it was right in the middle of the coronavirus shutdown. You don't want him coming No, but he looked pale and, and sick and not well. And, well he just and, had long you know, hair. Just He's out. 90. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, fair enough. He, he looked great. He, he looked great. Look There's some deadlifts. Get out there. <laughs> he got, him and Nassim should work out together, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just, yeah, There's. I think having missed, you know, he sold into it. And then I think that there had been a little bit of a, a meme beforehand that maybe Berkshire had lost it. Value investing's over. Buffett's Buffett's too old. Didn't pull the trigger. All of that seemed to reinforce it. There's really been no signs of light yet out of it. Um, I I I kind of like probably for sentimental reasons. It, like it did come into my screen. I'm not I'm not buying it for sentimental reasons. It's in my screen because I think it's cheap yep. uh, and good. But uh, you know, for sentimental reasons, I would like to see the best to ever do it go in one more time with. Uh, a, cashed up to kind of do something big and I, I hope he gets another opportunity I, I i just don't know like i'm not i'm not a market predictor guy but i hope he does it was it, to me it was reminiscent this whole um sort of vitriol from the general public was very reminiscent of 2000 of 99 2000 warren's lost it um, you know, he is 80% behind you know berkshire down 35 s p up 50 
um, that 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 dispersion in performance. And he again, this is this is what value and and Warren Buffett maybe is a, a type of value. So obviously there are different types of value investing. So a little bit more quality and moats and whatnot. But at the end of the day, he was willing to stay the course, keep his discipline, and from ninety eight to two thousand and three, you know. It 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 he 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 gains it all back and then goes on to outperform by a spectacular amount over over the general market, which just goes to the you know the fact that value is tough. It's it's tough. The value of value is is tough, and and if you're going to uh, garner any return from any factor, it means when it's tough, you gotta you gotta absorb this risk. You gotta absorb these periods because there will be brighter days. You gotta sin a little. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you guys what is the what is the character of value? I know that that um, for example, trend following, which obviously we we've spent a lot of time on, has mm. this character where like the the simpler versions of it uh, have a lot more losing trades, losing weeks, losing months than than positive mm. months. But the positive months are so much larger than the losing months that it, it's profitable over the long term. Value seems to me to have that a similar kind of profile, obviously different reasons and at different times, but you got if if you miss those periods where value runs, that runs for like a few weeks or a few months, but if you miss them, then it's it's game over. You've you've missed all of the potential returns from missing that narrow window. So it, it has to be one of those things, unless you've got extremely high accuracy in your ability to forecast when value is going to do well. I've never seen any of that does a good job with that. But if not, then you've just really just got to stick with it, which is painful. And, it, you know, like Wes always says, embrace the suck. But it's got this character, right? So if you're not there when it runs, then you're out of luck. But is, so that, is, that, the character, so is that the character of value? Like, is it, it I always wonder whether it's, you got to be there at the worst time. That's when, that's when you make all the money. Um, I ran it back over a few. I ran just grabbed all of the fam the, the French library data and just had a look at how those um, the value decile of each of those factors, uh, each of those metrics, just like how, how, how relative to growth, how often are they underperforming, and by how far behind do they get at any given time? Just because I was like, this is crazy how far behind we've got so far, and I summed all of the times that it's underperformed. So over that data set. They've underperformed like 70 to 80% of the time. But the right. outperformance is massive over the full data set. It's really hard to get your head around why it works the way that it does. It's, if anything, it confused me more. It just made me realize that you can't predict it. You just got to stay in it. It's going to rip sometimes and it's going to lag sometimes. And just you just got to ignore it, even though and the times when it's like underperforming the most, like now, it's really, it's the best opportunity in it, but it's, there's no, it doesn't have very many friends. There aren't many people out there who believe in it right now. You've got to be probably, pretty probably bloody minded want, to stay in it. Probably when you want it, right? Um, I mean, Wes, when you, just going back to your, to your roots, when you first started looking mm -hmm. at this stuff, yeah. there were so many areas that you could have explored. And this is a, this is true for almost anybody that I talk to that likes the markets. Like everybody starts yeah. off as a value investor. If yeah. it's so painful, why is it the most love factor on the planet? Like, what was it that attracted you to it initially? I mean, for me, it was just it was just intuitive. Um, and and I got I got schooled up. My my grandmother was like a huge Warren Buffett, Ben Graham fan forever. Um, and I, you know, I grew up on a cattle ranch and used to buck hay and was broke as shit. So I wanted to get rich. So I talked to my grandma and, uh, and I don't know, it just made sense to me. Like, Hey, if I can buy, you know, stuff that everyone hates and it's cheap and I'm willing to sit there and deal with the pain, like I'm just naturally that like, well, that makes sense to me. Um, so I don't know, it, but, but it has been I think, or Toby probably knows better, but I think Ben Graham said it's like inoculation. You either you either get it or you don't. And for me, I was just like, this is common sense, dude. Like, why wouldn't you do this? Um, so my system one was definitely just I was, you know, I was in tune with the force of value. And then then for me, because that became my religion, you know, it, it actually took actually deliberate thinking to move into like momentum and trend and you know stuff you guys talk about. But because that was not intuitive or a good idea at all in my monkey brain sense, but I don't know, man, just bad genes, I guess. I just, it raises a good question, though. like, 
what to what extent should personality or just sort of natural, you know, um, inclination, like just how you're wired, inform how you should invest? You know, like to what extent is it is it more about just investing in alignment with your with your faith and with your your personality and with your belief systems relative to investing in alignment with where there's maximum evidence. Like there's gotta be yeah. a Venn diagram there, but how do you weight those attributes? Um, I mean, honestly, like more and more as I deal with more and more people, um, I think it's it like the re the, the wonderful thing about Warren Buffett has nothing to do with the fact that he's underperformed for the past 15 years. It's the fact that the people that own that stock stick with it through thick and thin, no matter what. So in, in many respects, he's done such a great service to people, not because he underperformed, outperformed or whatever. It's just he made people stick to the program no matter what. So so I, I'm just a huge fan where I don't give a shit what you do. You want to do like Ouija board investing, whatever your process is, I frankly don't care. I just want to know what is your ability to stick to that process and I will gauge your, your capability to be a good, successful investor. Um, what are the optimal parameters for the Ouija board strategy? <laughs> anyone, um, has anyone tested yeah. that? It's a, are you kidding yeah, me? I, yeah. I, I wrote that up. I'll send you the code. Yeah, I was wondering. Weird. Okay, that's what you uh, remember. Mike does not know how to code, so this is going to be interesting. <laughs> yeah, you want to have the evidence-based Ouija board is my favorite one. Um, that's right. But hey, if you stick to the evidence-based Ouija board, you'll probably do all right. Because if anything, <laughs> that Ouija board will randomly hit like different risk premia that you'll get to capture and enjoy over the long haul, even if you didn't know that. Um, One thing that I always find it to be a bit of a mystery, and actually maybe you guys can answer this, because when you look at the data, it, it seems like the value premium is 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 really strong in, in small cap and also in, in really weak in large cap, but yeah. you don't, like obviously just from a market capacity standpoint, everyone can't be a small cap value investor. What do you guys see as a, as a, like a cross section of like where actual capital is allocated? Do people still allocate to large cap value? Is that a thing? Depends on how you're measuring it a little bit, right? If you look, if you're using price to book, then basically 94% of the market, it doesn't work for the 6% of the market that it does work for is probably a bid ask spread measuring problem. And you can't right. allocate any capital to it anyway. But if you use those flow metrics, like there's, if you're using EV EBIT, uh, EV EBIT price to cash or EV cash flow price to earnings, any of those, like, I think they scale pretty well. If you divide a bigger universe by decile of those things, you definitely get some outperformance uh, by you know long short or just long the the undervalued stuff. I think it, I think it I think it does work in that stuff. The reasons why, I mean, I think that intuitively. Buying something for less than it's worth, as Wes says, like the the inoculation comment by Buffett, I think it was. I think there's two kind of mindsets of people who I've come across in the market. There are people who, yeah, I want to buy a bargain, and there are people who are like, that's that's ridiculous. You buy stuff that's going up, like you, you buy. You, there are guys who are just congenitally trend momentum kind of guys, and they should be momentum guys. But if you're if you want to buy bargains, you should be a value guy. If that makes sense to you, and like Wes, like I, I I can read the data on momentum. I fully believe that it's a more robust strategy than value, but it just doesn't. It just personality wise, it doesn't appeal to me, whereas value well, does. Well, I, I've that never really met an advisor. Yeah, I've never met an advisor that doesn't. When you tell them the value story, they're like, "Yeah, but have you seen the chart?" There's no way. I'm <laughs> Right? <laughs> Everybody's a chartist, which basically ends up being a trend, some sort of trend momentum manager, right? Right. Um, it's uh, it's the do no homework approach for a lot of people. And to, to answer Adam's question on the on the mega cap versus micro cap and value, um, kind of to to Toby's point, that highly it's highly dependent on what metric you use, right? Because like book to market kind of sucks, but it sucks in a sharp ratio sense. Right. Like like if you buy just mega cap cheap stocks, they earn higher expected returns. It's just they're volatile as shit. So, you know, if, if you believe you can eat sharp ratios, maybe it's a bad idea. But if you're just got a 30 year horizon, you want to you know compound your face off. If I have the option between like large cap cheap versus S&P and I don't really care about the sharp ratio kind of like, well, that's not a bad bet. Right. 
Um, so it kind of depends on what you're trying to achieve there. And then to Toby's point, if you use like EBIT yields or, you know, earnings yields or anything else, uh, that's a little bit more high frequency measure. It's going to work better in large cap, but I don't know if you guys listen to Ken French. Uh, he was recently on a podcast with, um, Ben Felix and those guys, and he just admitted that book to market is not the best value metric, but it's the metric that has the lowest turnover, i.e., hint, hint, wink, wink, we can jam $500 billion into it, right? right? So if I'm thinking about a scale asset management firm, I'm not going for the best value metric. I'm going- Not naming any best. names here. No. Yeah, yeah, not naming any names here. And, and God bless, uh, you know, people that start with DF. Kevin and Anger. Um, <laughs> there's just, you have to make a trade-off in, in the capital markets. You go for scale or do you go for, you know, boutique? Uh, I think- think yeah. That's a massively underappreciated point and that that allocators, investors, um, fi financial intermediaries overlook like they're not. And I think you've got some great tools on uh, on your site, Wes, that that sort of show that. Well, what are you going for? Are you going for scale as an asset company? Yeah. Or are you going for pure factor exposure? as maybe maybe a mid-tier or a boutique i mean even some of the large guys are are, are lining up and, and starting to offer the more sort of um, factor concentrated portfolios which then then begs the question of okay so once you do get massive pools of capital chasing that does that yeah. far that away yeah um, but a solid underperformance like we've had recently <laughs> will certainly help yeah. It doesn't it. seem like there's a there's a steady flow of large <laughs> sources of capital into those portfolios. <laughs> right now. There's not much evidence of that. Yeah. So, so <laughs> there is now. Yeah. Over the last few days. For a moment. Yeah. I think also the, the thing that you point out is, um, you know, Buffett, Buffett's ability, just talking about Buffett, let's say, as, a, as, a, as an example, to educate uh, investor slash consumers on the, the concept of vol, right? The idea that... In the in the, what's the what's the quote in the short term the, the the market is a voting machine in the long term it's a weighing machine which is a a very sort of folksy way to say hey listen you know it's not the sharp ratio it's actually the excess return and you should ignore or use the short term volatility as an opportunity um, not as a measurement as to what your long term outcomes might be. Okay, you're and, in the and, metaphor um, penalty box, Philbrick. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What did I, what did I do? No, I'm, I'm, I'm you backwards? Did I get? Uh, did I dyslexic that? No, I just think <laughs> the the weighing voting machine is just like it's a it's a more of a sentiment engine in the short term, but it's it's yeah. uh, equilibrium engine in the long term, right? And yeah. um, so if you're buying, if you're if you're legitimately buying uh, dollars for, as we'd say, loonies for, you know, 50 cents or dollars for 50 cents, then, uh, eventually the market's going to recognize the value and, and trade to equilibrium. And I think that's the, uh, Buffett's been really great at, at, at making that clear, clear yeah. point. I mean, is there anyone who wouldn't want to buy a strategy where you, where you're buying companies for 50 cents that are worth a dollar? I mean, well, the point is, is that the easiest it's, pitch in that it's, world? it's the downside vol. It's the, it's the vol of the strategy that creates the the dispersion of outcomes and value, which allows you to take advantage of Mr. Market in the short term to yeah. reach equilibrium in the long term. So I will push back on your judgment of my. I see. So you're saying that that by virtue of volatility, that randomness eventually can can push the push prices lower and give Correct. opportunities to buy in the short term lower prices. But in the gotcha. long term, that volatility is dampened. By the nature of the long term versus the short term, actually so. brings up a question from Brian Moriarty. Okay. Says, uh, "Why don't you talk about uh, talk about how value is suddenly too expensive? Maybe, especially after being touted as cheap just a few weeks, months ago." Also, hey, yeah, it's not it's not too expensive yet. It, it'll get there. Hopefully, with any luck, it'll get too expensive. But I think well, it's like 2027, 20, 2030 20, is the the time that's going to get there. The thing, the other thing worth pointing out is that nobody's just buying on price ratios, right? Wes doesn't buy on price ratios. I don't buy on price ratios. AQR doesn't buy on price ratios. There's not a single, there's this like pervasive view among the discretionary value guys that what, what quantitative value guys are doing is like buying, uh, like buying on price to book value and that's it. Like you just run a screen 
find all the cheapest stuff and price the book value and head to the beach. Nobody's doing that. Everybody's trying to mimic what discretionary value guys do, which is dig into the book. Like how, how high quality is that balance sheet? How good's that business? How fat are those margins? Right. You know, what, what's the chance this thing goes into bankruptcy? What's the chance that this is a fraud? There's earnings manipulation. Like everybody's throwing every single thing they can think of at it, looking at what the discretionary guys are doing, that binding that back into the model, like working it all the time to try and recreate. But what we're trying to avoid is just all the systematic errors that uh, people tend to make when they're discretionary because they get scared out on March 23, which is the best time. Or you look at the rally from the bottom and you say, well, value's not doing it. Value's dead. I'm getting out. And I can see it in the volume in my in my funds. Like the volume dries up, then then the fund goes on a little run. All the volume comes back in, and then it quietens out, and the volume stays. It's it's the you can see it in the underlying shares. You can see it in the uh, in the in the fund. You can see it. You can see it everywhere. It's just the only way you can take advantage of it is just to ignore it and just to stay in it and think about it like once every year or so. So, what does that look like in terms of systematizing? As like you said, the process of how would a discretionary manager uh, look at it, but you want to systematize it. What does that look like? I know Wes, you guys have a bit of a qual. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think it's a quality screen before you yeah. sort on um, valuation got metrics. I don't know. Got, if it's a, the got same. a great book here that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think I've got that book on my shelf. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we get the Ouija board out. See. <laughs> and you, 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 that's a key component. Um, no, but but actually, before we go there, uh, Brian actually has a great question there. Um, yeah. And because we've noticed it, there's a lot of confusion because because you know Cliff has has his his piece on like oh my god value is so cheap it is like mind blowing. But what people always forget is he's talking about long short value. Like people that long stocks that are expensive or cheap and, and short shots that are expensive and no shit, that is the biggest spread that, you know, you could drive a truck through. Um, but when, you, when you're a long only value investor, which most of us actually are, you have an embedded beta bet. And like, so right now, like I can't say with a straight face that value as a long only investor is super cheap because like, you know, there's like an EBIT yield of 10 but hey, historically, that's actually not so cheap because all stocks are expensive. And because you have the embedded beta bet in there, you might relatively outperform the S&P. But, you know, if you're down, you know, 50 and the market's down 55, like, OK, that still sucks. Right. Because it whereas the long short bet is I would argue is probably pretty compelling right now. But that doesn't mean that long only funds or like some magical sauce because there's such a big beta bet that one needs to consider as well. Um, sl I'd slightly disagree with that. And I pulled, okay. the, I pulled the data off Alpha Architect's site uh, yeah. off, your, off your things and I put together this. That shit's not reliable. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you can use the French data too. It doesn't matter. You get the I'm same just answer. Kidding. Yeah, yeah. And so all I do is I run back, uh, I run back the yield of each of those price ratios against yeah, their own right. average over the full data set, make it roll so it's updated yeah. on it. They're all uh, they're all fat to their long-term, like they're all rich to their long-term mean to yeah. varying degrees. So price to cash flow is only about 5% rich, but it's still better than it is two thirds of the time. It's the worst. If you yeah. look at something like book to market, it is in the like, the, it's like been cheaper on like three other occasions and these are month end yeah. tests. And so the three other occasions are like March, this year and yeah. like so there's well, on, on uh, balance across all of them yeah. i think they're cheap like it's it's well, and, it's and in a handful the, of occasions yeah so, so so let me be clear I, I don't actually disagree with you on that point uh and i ryan actually wrote a blog post about that relative to the market value is cheap as shit relative to expensive stocks it's really cheap as shit but value when you have embedded beta bet in there like if you just look at like just the raw ebit yield on like like you know QV index, right? It's like 10%. But historically, you've been able to buy that at 20. So on just the absolute value, like on what's the earnings yield or EV yield or whatever on a portfolio, that right now is just not cheap because overall the market's not cheap. Right. So so, value, but what's the data on your site? Is it excess yields or is it is it no, absolute so, yields? So on our stuff, we put everything. We put we put the ratio of, of the value portfolio relative to the market. We do the raw the raw yields on value and glamour 
for growth. Like we, we just, if you look, there's a table below that where it, it's all, it's all in the eyes of the beholder. But the, the argument right now is value as a factor is cheap. But beta as a factor is expensive. expensive. And I believe yeah, that. we buy long it, only value, unfortunately, have the cheap bet on value, the expensive bet on beta. So on net, it's kind of like, you know, eh. but, but that, but you that also, data on your site, that data on your site has those yeah. absolute yields. And if you just run those yeah. absolute yields back, you know, this is, it's as cheap. Yeah. It's like I, the, 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 the rebuttal to that might be, well, that data only goes back to like 1992. So go and pull up yeah. the. Pull the French data, which is like price to cash flow, price yeah. to earnings. You can run that back to 52 or 3, I think 51, 2, 3, something like that. In yeah. any case, it's like it's absolutely cheap. It's absolutely higher than its long run. Meaning if you believe that the yield in the mm. value portfolio eventually drives your returns, which I do, yeah. it takes a little I while. Do. But when the yeah. yields are fatter, you get better returns. When the yields are thinner, yeah. you get worse returns. Like I think mm -hmm. it's a pretty good, it's a good time to be making a bet. That's not to say that it can't get the yields can't get high, you know, which is you're, you're underperforming yeah. while that's happening. But I think that now's, yeah. a, now's a pretty good time. I got a little long short component to my book, but I like the long side of that bet too. And that's something that Cliff looked at. He looked at the, the long side versus the middle and the middle versus the, yeah. the, 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 the other stuff. And he said, is this, is this being driven by expensive stocks relative to the middle or is this being driven by short stocks relative to the middle? And he said, it, it's actually not just expensive stuff on the long on the on the short mm -hmm. side it's actually cheap stuff on the on the long side as well it's driving the spread is unusually wide i, I like the bet yeah. either way here toby your well, short book is it uh, yeah, right. i'm just playing advocate against it that it's not uh depending on how you, there are angles you can look at it where it's it's marginally compelling but it's not like the the pitch that asnes gave that's like holy cow this is incredible because that's they're selling market neutral value, which I agree is pretty damn compelling. But God bless you for being able to stick to that one. Well, um, the other thing I think so I, I'm with I, haven't, you. I, I haven't looked at your stuff guys, for so about a. I'm in. I, I think. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we hear about you, a year yeah. ago, about a year ago, I think I looked at your site uh, and looked at your index and found that there's because this is this is important for the audience to understand, right? You have. Uh, uh, S and P 500 beta, which is around one, and then you have the value beta, which is 0.6, right? So in essence, you're getting a levered portfolio, a 60%, in essence, levered portfolio of pure value, but you do have that underlying 100% beta exposure that you're saying is expensive right now. While beta, the beta part, uh, aspect of your index may be cheap, the mm -hmm. beta of the S and P itself is expensive and that's where you gotta, you know, when you're a long only manager, you gotta take into account that bigger part of the pie. Yeah. That makes sense. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, th that's what I'm saying uh, for, for sure. Like, like, like there's just, there's two bets you're taking there. Well, there's a lot of them, they're small, so, but, but you know, just take the simple bets of value and then the beta bet when you just do a long only value portfolio. Toby's stuff's obviously a little bit more compelling because it's value long, you know, beta bet and a short bet on glamour. So, so he's got another element, which is arguably more compelling based on Cliff's argument, but um, yeah, you, you've got it. It's just, you want to think that you also own the beta bet. So in a, in a vacuum, you know, assuming you, know, you want to think about that as well, when you buy a long only value fund. Uh, the only thing I'd say fund. to that is when you, when you look at there are, there are different analogs for this market, right? There are lots of different analogs, but one of them is 2000, where you had a very expensive market with very beaten down value stocks. And then you went through a period of time where the market did mean revert back down towards its mean. I don't think it really ever got there, but it kind of, it's been trending down back up again recently on sort of like cyclically cyclical measures, which I realize that they don't work that well, but they, they are predictive of your returns over extended time frames 10 20 30 years so probably the market's expensive at the moment the returns forward returns are a little bit lower but value i think is absolutely cheap and i think it's cheap based on the data on your website <laughs> and I, maybe yeah. i'm misunderstanding that data on your website but i'm just running it back against you know if the yields are fatter now than they have been through most of the data and some in some instances they're close to as fat as they have ever been now, I look at the same data and it's cheap, but it's not like as I think Wes, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. I think you're sort of saying Astis said you're like, you know, at the hundredth percentile in terms of the uh, in terms of historical data. And I think Wes, you're sort of saying it's more like the 60, 65th, 75th percentile and on, on some of the metrics flow. that matter. It's yeah, true for free cash flow. 
yeah, what, what I'm just saying is is that if you're if you're long, cheap, short, expensive on any metric, that's in like the hundred percentiles across the board right. part. If you're looking at things like value against the market, to maybe what Toby's talking about here, it's also pretty damn cheap across the board. Someone range from like 80 percentile to 100 percentile. But what I'm talking about is if you just look at like literally, let's just not do EBIT yields. Let's do earning yields, right? Just earnings over price on the cheap 10 percent decile against itself. Like let's say it's like 10 percent right now. That 10% measure, i.e. basically a 10 PE on the cheapest 10, 10% decile, that is not that cheap relative to its history. Like the top decile, you know, turd stock portfolio, you know, it usually fluctuates like 10 is like okay, but it can get up to 20, 25. That's what I'm saying. Just on an absolute burn, <laughs> you know, want to use that one, it's not like 100 percentile. Maybe it Maybe I'm misunderstanding the data on your website, but yeah. Ryan Ryan Curlin wrote Ryan Curlin wrote a nice article using that data Ooh. where he he showed they were all pretty they were rich to their means, and then I went and checked it using the same yeah. data, just pulled it down. I yeah. took an average of each a rolling average of each metric updated each day starting 1992 yeah. up to I think I did it. It was like I had March or April data yeah. when I did it. Sure. That all of those metrics are currently rich to their long run, to their own means over that period of data since 1992. The the one that is the least uh, rich is price to free cash flow, which is still in the 65th. It's still cheaper than it has been two thirds of the time. Yeah. Book to market price to earnings, and some of the and and something else in it like they are extremely cheap. Price to earnings is 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 getting close to the hundredth decile. Uh, sorry, hundredth percentile. It's like 97, something like that. Yeah, so yeah this is argument. To the market for sure. That's, um, but yeah. are they not? Are they are they absolute or are they relative? No, no. So 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 yeah. May, maybe I'm just being too confusing because I'm an idiot, right? So so relative to the market. So for example, like the, let's say the earnings to price yield, right? Like I'm just making this up because I kind of memorized the data, but not totally. But let's say right now it's like ten, right? So it's like ten percent earnings yield right now. The S and P is like five. Right. So so if you've got a two times, that's a big ass spread that is compelling relative to history. And that might be what you're looking at. Like, but what I'm talking about is just like, let's say an earnings yield of 10, that on a standalone basis is not that compelling uh, relative to like how the cheap, the earnings yield of the cheap stock bucket throughout time. Right. And that's mainly driven by the fact that the problem is that just the market's so damn expensive right now. Right. So the whole ceiling has been dropped where like in the old days. Yeah. Um, we yeah. I mean, I don't know what you're which one you're looking at here. Yeah. So this is just a, a, something from um, Wolf Research that I got this, yeah. this week. Right. So you sort of trailing earnings yield. This goes back to sort of 85, 85. All these mm -hmm. go back to 85, the cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio. But, you know. It, just to give a sort of example, this one I thought was, I think this is sort of what you're referring to, um, maybe Toby, right? The EBITDA enterprise value. Oh, it starts full screen now. Yeah, yeah. If I make it full screen, it may not. Uh, oh, that's better. Okay. Yeah. I can actually pull up the data. I'm, I don't know if I can share stuff with you guys, but. Uh, of course you can. Yeah. Oh, can, can you? Yeah, cool. Yeah. Maybe I'll just. I'll share my, once, once you there's, go through there's that. There's that share screen button in the bottom. So when you're, when you're ready, when you're ready, pop it up. Okay. But Adam, yeah. please, please describe what you're talking about as well for yeah. the listener. Well, yeah, I mean, these, these are just the, um, where the current, um, I think this is the long portfolio relative to the, um, it's historical, um, yields and, so it, it does look like we're sort of in the middle of the range on some of these guys, but um, you know, maybe, maybe they sort of skew a few of them skew cheap, skew expensive. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I do, I do think it's interesting that like I find all the time that the most heated debates and discussions are between people who are like, you know, agree on 99% of the things. And then like, yeah, you know, on, the same team, yeah. on, on this most nuanced point are, are uh, yeah, yeah. disagreeing. So, so what I'll do is, is let me just show you my screen real quick. Yeah. Guys. So there's a share screen um, thing. Do you, yeah, 
because it's almost certainly the case that Tobin and I will not disagree on anything if we know that we're talking about the same thing. So same data, is, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we're just having a miscommunication here. Well, I thought I was using your data. That's that's why I'm confused. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, like Toby's just the smarter version of me, and I try to act <laughs> like him. So, so if, we're, if there's any disagreement here, it's not like like we're disagreeing on 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 ideas. I think there's probably just miscommunication on the on data here. So let me. I, I don't know. Can you guys see? Uh, Did you press your uh, screen? There's a little button in the bottom. Okay. So can you see this thing? Yeah, it's coming up. Yep. 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 Okay, cool. So, so let's just move away from the charts. And so you guys see this data table down here? Yeah. Okay, cool. So what we do is, and we actually just added, uh, added Canada recently. If you click on columns. Is this for the call? Did you do that for the call? No, no. Just in, in, in general, I've added, I'm going to start adding it for all the, um, yeah, I, 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 I love Canada. So I'm trying to hook you guys up, but this is just something that I'm trying to implement throughout the system. But, but long story short, right now we've got U.S. market, you know, developed market international. And then now I just recently added Canada specifically on EBIT yields. And I'll do the other ones over time. But in this table, what you'll see is, is there's the obviously the period. Um, and then then what this is, is U.S. value. This is the, the EBIT yield. So there's a 15 percent operating income to EV ratio. For, for the cheapest decile of value stocks, right? And then Glamour is zero. So this is like the 10% decile, 15% EBIT yield, the 10% the, the ex most expensive flat. And there's the spread between, um, th this is actually between the, the US value and the market, the universe. So this would be like the S&P 500, right? And then same thing with EFI. Uh, it's got the EFI. What's the what's the yield on the the actual decile portfolio? What's the yield on the decile glamour portfolio? And then what is the spread? Where the spread is going to be equal to the EFI value and the universe? Okay. Um, That's we'll an eight percent in EFI. Yeah, and, and then yeah, and then these over here on the right, these are the ratios. So the U.S. value ratio is the EBIT yield on U.S. value relative to the U.S. universe. Right. The EFI val e value ratio is obviously the EFI value relative to the EFI universe. Um, and if you so look you, up let's, here- Let's, let's uh, say those verbally for the uh, for the for those listening only. So that's yeah. 1.5 for U.S. and 1.5. Sure, so, so, um, so the, so yeah. the EFI value ratio is- Sorry, Wes, we lost you there for a bit. You were about to tell us the, the numbers here. So the EFI value ratio was what? Oh, 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 oh sorry. I, I was going to try to re-explain slowly for the readers what yeah. the ratios mm -hmm. represent. Um, but can you guys see this chart right here? Mm -hmm. yep. yep. Okay, cool. And, and we can do these for all these, but what it can just quickly visualize this. So the, the, we'll just do uh, international value first. So what this shows, this is the historical time series of the valuation of the top decile cheapest securities relative to the EFI universe. And if you see here, it's definitely cheap, right? There's only two other periods where it's been cheaper. Um, and, and, that, and that's what, why you would get the argument that, hey, right now, value is cheap, which is what everyone's saying, right? Great. Um, same thing, U.S. So if you look at U.S., U.S. is generally a rung down overall, um, but the U.S. cheap decile portfolio relative to the market, that spread kind of argument, is that it's pretty damn cheap. It's not the cheapest, but it's pretty compelling. Canada, we won't talk about, uh, yes. if you guys want to, but Canada is not that compelling right now. But you guys also have, we're just using 150 stock universe here, so the data is pretty noisy. Um, which is why this is an experimental. Thing. Well, that's probably 95% of market cap. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, that's true. It's it just, it's, it's, um, it's noisy because it's just the uh, portfolios are, uh, you know, concentrated. It's concentrated. I mean, could, right. it's basically telling you it is not, it's not a great deal in Canada right now, but I always caveat that with caveat that with, um, you know, the fact that it's just, you know, it's a smaller, more concentrated marketplace. So you take it for what it's worth. 
Where's um, the averages so, for so each of those? All, like, well, I'm sorry, say again? Do you have the averages for those? And is that absolute yield or is that spread over I, the market? This is literally the ratio of the of the yield. So it's like taking like, let's say the, well, let's do it right here. So, so it's the average of the market. Of one, yeah, it's like, so 15% is the is literally the, the, it's actually the median to keep it cleaner. It's the median EBIT yield on securities in the top decile cheapest bucket. Got it. Against the median EBIT yield on the universe, the U.S. universe, 7.8. So if you take 15.01 divided by 7.8, you know, you get 1.92. So it's just like the ratio kind of. Um, it, it's so you can kind of visualize, you know, how, how are cheap stocks looking relative to the universe? And to your point, on, on all these different ways we calculate that, it's pretty damn compelling. What, what I'm highlighting, though, is that if you look over here on, on U.S. value, let's just rank these on just absolute cheapness, right? So let me uh, – it, it, this is like a huge data table, unfortunately. Um, if, you guys, if you guys got a big audience, people go in here and break my server. Uh, if everyone starts doing this at the same time. Um, but well, there's, there's 36 people watching at the moment. I think yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to grow the audience. 38 yeah. <laughs> um, so, so let me just sort this. I just did it on min, but but I'll sort it on uh, on max. And, and like right now, we're probably you know it's probably like ten percent is like the EBIT yield or like the operating income over EV. And then uh, and you and you'll you'll see here once I sort this damn thing if it ever works. Sorry, it's slow. But but long story short, that's not cheap. Like there's plenty of times that might even be lower than the average. Where, where usually you can buy just a straight up EBIT yield of maybe like 15% on like the cheapest dirt ball stocks. And, and so, yes, it's true that U.S. or value is definitely cheap relative to the market. It's not on an absolute just, you know, you put a gun to my head um, you, you, because you've got the beta bet in there and that's really expensive. It, it's kind of smushing down the, the absolute kind of yield you can achieve even amongst the cheapest securities out there. So just um, to clarify what that so is that yield the mm -hmm. is that yield the yield it's the median yield of the yep. stock in that cheap decile basket. Yeah. Okay. And if you if you take yeah. the average of that column, yeah. I'll bet you that that is richer than it is like uh most of the time. Uh, well, okay. So, I mean, you, you, yeah, that, that's, uh, possible, but I don't, I don't think it's likely because I'll just show you, cause see how I got it sorted here on, on, on max to min. So for example, in the depths of hell in 2008, that, that decile portfolio, I mean, you could. Uh oh, lost him back into the matrix. Yeah. He'll be back. Like yeah, in that what he was saying is in 2009 we're looking at here uh, February of 2009 the US value metric was 31%. Oh, so that, that's why I'm saying uh, yeah. and I don't I don't I should I don't have that offhand. I'm going to build this in our studio so it has all these stats a lot easier. But right now like a 10% EBIT yield relative to the history of what traditionally you can usually get cuz usually equity markets aren't so expensive is not that cheap. Like I'm scrolling here like you know, it's you, 15, you, mate. It's 15. You should have a look at that. You should go through that data. And, and like, I, I get the feeling that maybe we're talking about different things because I'm talking about yeah. the, on the number of occasions that are in there. Okay. There are like only a handful of occasions that are richer than now. Maybe you're okay. talking about like the spread. So you're saying 30% is really, really rich. 15% is not really rich. Well, but I'm saying if you look at the number. Yeah. So just, just go, can you just go back up again? Scroll to the top. Yeah. So we're, just, 12, we're 12, 6 right now. Uh, as of uh, April 30. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's, I mean, it's bounced from where it was in March at the end of March, yeah. but it was like 15, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That, in March, it was definitely good, which is why I did a dumb decision of blowing out trend falling. But, um, but right now it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, that's, that's the argument here, or at least playing devil's advocate because it's easy for me to just say, go buy value shit right now. Um, Cause that'd be great <laughs> if everyone did that, but I'm, I'm just trying to create a discussion here. Keep it real. Yeah. So, so there you go. See, I sorted it back. So we're, we're 12, six right now. And yeah, you're right. I guess you're talking about more like, like cyclical periods. 
Is that what you're going for? Because like 08 has a bunch of these totally crazy observations. I think you'll find that there aren't very many observations that, I mean, I, I haven't seen the, the data updated as of the end of April. I think the last data yeah. that I had was March. Mm -hmm. It was the end of March, which was, uh, yeah. which was very, very cheap. No, no, I think it was the April data that I used. Yeah. Um, for many of these, like if you look at that peak, there are only a handful of, uh, there are only a handful of data points that are above that mm -hmm. line. Yeah, I, I mean, you know what? I, I could buy your argument because a lot of these things are like overlapping. It's it's like when you look at like rolling returns, like it seems like you've got 100 observations, but you really got three. Um, so so if you kind of thought in that sense, like now, you know, versus, you know, the 2000 or 2008 versus 2000s. Uh, I, I could actually buy that then. If you think, I also think like if you think about it slightly differently, which is mm -hmm. you want to be an equity investor, you want to be long stocks. When is it when is it most advantageous to skew towards being long value stocks? Well, the value yeah. premium over the market in terms of of uh, EBIT yield is is pretty good, right? It's yeah. you know that's what the chart shows, right? Like relative yeah. to the market, it's the value portfolio is relatively attractive yeah. on a historical basis. Relative to its own history, yeah. there's some more ambiguity. Right, so, but if you so I actually disagree between... with that, that's the point that I disagree with. I think if you pull that data and you ran it against its and you ran it against itself, you'd find that yeah. it's cheap now on any of those metrics, but particularly on price to earnings, book to market. Mm -hmm. uh, the the worst one is price to cash flow, which is about five percent rich in it, yeah. and it's it's still cheaper than it is on two thirds of occasions. Though, and the other ones are like, yeah, you really have to saying. go and find. You find there yeah. are like a handful of months right at the very depths of the two thousand. Uh, value underperformance and, and like may, maybe 2009, March 2009. Other than that, uh, yeah. Yeah. Th this is like about as good as the opportunity gets. Oh, the, the I'm not saying it's clear that it is, it is the third cheapest in the last, what, yeah. however far back that went, right? And there yeah. were, there the were just church, momentary glimpses of that. Regime, yeah. Regime, that's right. Yeah. Which is yeah. not to say that it can't keep on getting cheaper, but if you're going to make the bet, yeah. you've got to start putting the bet on at a time like this because it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to get cheaper either. It can start, it can True. turn around here True. too. Well, and, and there's a question in that so, sort of how do you suggest retail investors implement a factor view like this, which I think is relevant to are, are you supposed to wait for the cheapest moment? Are you supposed to allocate? <clears throat> The cheapest Through moment is period. always just preceded by one moment that gets a little bit cheaper. Of course. Yeah. Agreed. So this, I think this is the point of the question, right? So knowing mm -hmm. that uh, this is one of your tweets, Wes, I mean, of course, yeah. you pick the bottom and then buy small cap value. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in retrospect, um, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't get that second page of the note on how to know, in <laughs> fact, how it was the bottom. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I spilled coffee on it. My dog ate it. Um, That's so, what Wes so, was saying when his when his mic went down. I thought yeah, that was the second again, yeah. spelling Damn out it. the second page there. Damn you, Wes! How to time the bottom, Newman? So uh, no, so, I, 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 how, how I, should we do that? How should we help yeah, the Rico? So, um, so it depends, right? I mean, I mean, it just think about. It. So what you're trying to bet on is value and beta, and you could buy this in market neutral form. That'd be the pure play bet. If you want to do that then, you know, go use some of your excess leverage or whatever to go buy some AQR stuff, right? But most people can't do that because they don't understand how to deal with all this stuff, yeah. right? It's a retail um, question. Retail yeah, question. So. normal dude who's just, you know, Joe Blow hooking and jabbing, you know, they're not going to deal with all the AQR shit. I would say, hey, you probably own beta in your portfolio anyways. Instead of owning S&P, like replace it with some value fund because you're going to basically get S and P bet. Two val, bet I val. You can't say it. I can. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Two val, I val, zig. Yeah. These yeah. Are things, these are letters. Yeah, I got a, I got a long shot up. portfolio. You can jump <laughs> into <laughs> yeah, yeah. These are letters that you, if you type them into a Google search, they will lead you somewhere that will have something to do with the names on this call. Yeah. So, Go. so, so that's how retail guy, you just got to ship from your equity bucket to the to the value bucket and then you're going to get the equity beta bet still but now you're going to get more of this value bet where if you really think of S&P what is that it's just mega cap kind of high quality US beta bet so if you if you kind of peel away the lens that um there's just assets and everything is a factor portfolio which they are it, then you just you're just thinking okay what bets am I actually taking and let's place the bets we want um 
I think this is this is a good jumping off point to, to to understand from the retail perspective what the tracking error tolerance is for the individual investor. So it's a very tailored question, and mm. one where we made fun a little bit earlier about the larger providers who provide a big beta vet beta bet with a small value tilt. And so you've got to think about as a, a retail investor or serving retail investors or even institutional investors who have to report to a board that doesn't necessarily understand these nuances. That that decision is a very important decision. Do you want to go long, short, true factor? Do you want to do concentrated, long only factor exposure? Or do you want to do beta portfolio with factor tilt? Yeah, and that's a massive those, pet peeve of mine. Massive right, pet right. peeve. And it's just brutal because it's 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 so easy to say my factor etf is cheaper than your factor etf but the question is what your active share is in that etf how much actual value are you providing for the dollar that you are asking the advice the investor to put the fee in? yeah and so if you're charging 10 basis points i don't even know what like these um these etfs that are basically 95 percent beta and 5% value are charging, but they're charging the right amount. They're super cheap because they shouldn't be charging anything. Beta is basically free. You know, the yeah. more the more thoughtful you are, the more um, uh, active share you have, the more concentrated you are, the more likely, and, and you're buying really deep value stocks, like I know you guys do, you're getting a better portfolio because you're getting the the exposure from the market and you're getting the value exposure. Now that's that's a double-edged sword, right? You're, you're yeah. <laughs> because it means that when value is on, when your long value is on, you are making a return above the market. And and you're basically getting a hundred, like, and I'm just using this number because I remember from a couple of years ago, but I think it's like 160% exposure, 100% to beta and 60% to value. And you're, you're only paying for the value part. The problem is that value could be negative and therefore the tracking area we're talking about, Mike, which is mm -hmm. there are times when S&P, I thought it was 160%. Well, value can be negative for a year where beta is positive, and it means that your value long only ETF that has a lot of active uh, um, active, active share uh, will have a negative return or a negative delta yeah. to that beta, right? So this totally is important. I mean, it, you you this is pay so you pay for what you get for, right? Well, yeah, here's and, the thing: it's, it's about the process. Right. So the process of receiving beta plus factor and understanding the factor could be from time to time negative. That's not as hard as it is. That's not relevant. What's relevant is you you paid for the manager to deliver the factor over long periods of time, over short periods of time. That factor performance is going to vary between positive and negative. And what you want to see is your beta plus your factor. And if it's negative and the factor performance is negative, you give Toby and and uh, and Wes high fives. You're like, yeah, you nailed it. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. So, I mean, if you ask me, if you ask me personally, I'm going to want in my portfolios, I'm going to want the factor exposure and I want it to the purest extent that I can possibly tolerate, right? And, and, and if I think about that on a fee basis of how much I'm paying for that, I find that when I break down the, the fees of the products you guys offer, it's a bargain. It's a, an yeah. absolute bargain for the factor exposure. And even, even on the AQR, if you're willing to do, as Wes says, the brain damage to get behind the long short side of it, even that is actually pretty reasonable. Um, that's a that's a long. I, I think for retail investors, it's really a non. It's a, it's not even on the table. It's not something that can handle. It's not something they can buy. So for retail investors, my thinking is you're going to want to go in. You're going to want to have that factor exposure uh, really as pure as you can get it, plus or minus the beta, educate your clients, and then save the money and go buy the S&P at two basis points and save that. You're not to pay 25 basis points on 100% of the capital to get market beta plus a tiny 5% sliver of value is not as good as saying, I'm going to buy one of your products for 25% of my portfolio, pay the extra, extra fee. And then the other 75% pays zero, pays one basis point. Yeah. Cumulative, I'm saving money, right? And so we get caught on this treadmill of lower fees and whatnot, which are, you know, they're nuanced. And I think the some good tools on your oh, website Texas. too, Wes, to, for investors to sort of get, wrap their head around some of this stuff, right? Just 
how yeah. concentrated it's in the target characteristics or the different ETFs. And then you can kind of measure that against the basis points you're paying per yeah. unit of factor exposure. I mean, there's probably we're, a paper in that somewhere, or at least an article, but there's good tools. I got done today. Um, it's, it's now on like version 85. Uh, we, we started with Jen Choi back in the day, but yeah, we, we've got a, a software package we're about to launch out here. That's going to just blow people's brains out. Cause they're going to be like, Oh my God, dude. Wow. It's, you guys are going to like it. It's uh, it's coming to a theater new year. It's the uh, it's like the ultra transparency. You can't hide behind shit tool. Um, and it's very interesting. Uh, there's, there's no more hiding for closet indexers basically. Um, so it'll be an interesting dynamic in addition to the conversations out there on, you know, what you're buying, what you're paying for it. Uh, yeah, there's, you know what, we have an article. I just uh, forgot about this one, but we wrote an article called, called stop paying for active management beta and yeah. we lay it all out. Um, so if anybody's confused by what we just <laughs> discussed, and want to dig a little deeper, uh, go to Wes's site he's in, and, and wait uh, for what he's putting out. But in the meantime, we have this very short article that kind of, you know, lays it out for you. If you're getting yeah. added value um, that you can't get anywhere else, and on top of that, you're getting the, the cheap beta, you should do both because you're getting capital efficiency. If you decide you want to have 10% of your portfolio in value, um, uh, but, uh, but you also like your beta. Well, you can either choose to be in beta with these kind of very cheap, not really value ETFs, or you can have a, a an ETF for that 10% that's giving you a hundred or 16% uh, exposure on average, right? So you're getting the 10% the of the beta and on top of that 60% of the value. Again, I'm, I'm, uh, my yeah. frame of reference is from a couple uh, of years well, ago. I don't think that's interesting. You guys, I know, have written about it uh, very eloquently, and I found this pretty useful. You know, because I because we're in CTA world too. But the concept of vol buying is like a no shitter for CTAs. Like, oh, so I get twenty vol, I pay one percent. I, you know, I do ten vol, I pay one percent. That's, that's not right. fair. Don't get Rodrigo I, started. Oh we're, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a. Because uh, a lot of people don't buy, they don't buy managed futures that often because that's kind of a an Uber geek thing. But but when I've I've actually had some success explaining to people who don't even know what managed futures are, but you outline the vol buying per unit fee paid concept, and, you, and it's not totally analogous to what we're talking about, but it kind of is. It's it's, it's a, a cost it's per important. unit cost yeah. per unit of risk that you take, right? And yeah, so we exactly. for our for our SMAs, yeah. we charge like twelve. This is how this is how we talk to clients. We charge yeah. twelve basis points per unit of risk you want to take. Because we yeah. we give investors the opportunity to choose anywhere between six and twenty five. Yeah. And so what are your fees? They are uniform across the board. They are yeah. thirteen basis points per unit of risk, and then do them all. You want eight? All right. Well, you're getting something like ninety five basis points. You want twelve? You're getting hundred. You want twenty five? Well, you're gonna have to pay almost three percent. They're all the yeah. same. You're just yeah. paying for the exposure, right? I uh, actually I think. That yeah. Right on. I, oh, there's a, there's a question too that can you suggest how to apply long value short glamour besides Zig? Um, short uh, answer: No. Um, no given, given that the S and P is almost uh, almost always glamour anyway, can you buy a short ETF like SH, or is this too arbitrary of a scheme? So my first answer is no, you can't. But if we had to, maybe we'll talk about it. And I think you were just touching on that just a, a little bit, Wes, um, mm -hmm. on some of the trend following. So maybe you want to just tie that knot back to the question. Well, yeah. So obviously, Wiz would be first choice if anyone was ever going to do a long, short uh, value trade. But, um, but let's say- Wiz? Wiz or Zig? Oh, Zig, sorry, Zig, Zig, sorry, my bad. That was good. I like that. That's, that's, like, a, that's a Freudian slip right yeah, there. Yeah. 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 Somebody yeah. get yeah. this ticket yeah. really quick. Yeah. And then somebody do a screenshot yeah. of Toby's face with that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, Toby. Um, yeah. I love happy hour. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm totally gone on my gin and tonic. Zig, and then you're going to buy Zag for usually 49.99%, 49.99. But for the other two BIPs you're going to allocate to, um, yeah, you, you could buy some value thing and then short, you know, SP future or SP cash. You know, that's not hard. Um, 
but you know, we know people that actually did that because we have clients that actually do that. Uh, you know, because we deal with some pretty yeah. kind of complicated folks, and they did that going into March. Well, they got their fucking ass handed to them, yep. and so yes, you can do it, but it you better be on standby. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that's all I, got I, to I, think, I think you've got to have a real well, Toby. You you click in here because I think you you look like you wanted to say something. So well, it's just the, it. the the problem with I would love to set up a short only ETF. The problem is that the way that they treat the expenses in a short only ETF is that any dividends paid on the shorts get charged against me as if it's my mm -hmm. expense ratio, which is ridiculous because I don't get any credit on the long side for the dividends that get paid. So all of the short ETFs look like they've got these really high fee ratios, like 2.75. That's not what the manager is getting paid. The manager could, get, could be getting 50 bips or 25 bips out of that. It is but, negative carry though on the portfolio. Yeah, but you got to look at, say, so look at the way someone like Jim Chanos executes it, right? So you go to Jim Chanos and you ask for uh, his, sh you want some short exposure from him. So what he's going to give you is 190% long the index, 90% short his strategy. So you're 100% beta, then you're 90% uh, is hedged out. And what he's going to say, we're going to go up less than the market because we're in all of this junk that doesn't deserve to be there. When the market goes down, this stuff's going to fall like a rock. And when you look at what his portfolios have done, that's exactly what they do. They're really good portfolios. They kind of, they, he's very good at finding these, uh, these high quality shorts, you know, shorts that stuff that's kind of junky. And I think that's sort of slightly the key and something we kind of skated over a little bit here. We're only talking about really the value ratios. And it was one thing that I think Cliff dealt with really nicely in that paper. He says, when you bind in all the quality elements that, you know, Wes and I talk about it in quantitative value, there's a lot of elements in there that aren't technically value, they're technically quality. But mm -hmm. I think it's very hard to separate the two. And if you actually use those things and you look at the spread, like that's kind of what's driving the spread is there's a real lot, there's a lot of really junky stuff on the expensive side at the moment. Once you bind in stuff like share-based compensation that they're just spewing out all of these expensive <laughs> stocks, negative free cash flow, tons of debt on the balance sheet, you know, questionable business uh, business plan at all. And you can get short this stuff. The problem is it goes up 30% a year. So you need like some sort of momentum overlay on top of it. So you're not standing in front of a truck every time you do it. It's hard to do, which is why I stuck it in with long stuff as well. Uh, and I, I and as you say, it's negative drag. That's key. It is really hard to do um, because you are, when you're short the S&P 500, you're short a basket of well diversified market cap related stocks that when, yeah when and, and when that momentum comes back aka march 09 aka march 2020 aka what was the uh um bottom in 2003 they rip your face off i mean that short tears you a new asshole like <laughs> no other and I've watched it many times. So that performance that you had in the year before is often given back and more the next year. And thus you have this other investor behavioral aspect that you have to deal with. The person feels great in that they didn't take the drawdown in the next year when the recovery is 100% and they're negative 10, they're not feeling so great. So, you know, there's there's obviously some trend following um, filters that you can throw on top of that that might help. But there is no panacea here. There is just pick your poison. <laughs> yeah, and, you got to uh, that's it. Yeah. You know, but, but you also try and love to attract that kind of masochism than than Wes, right? Like that type of client that loves the oh, pain. Yeah. Oh, you like pain, Wes? I'll <laughs> tell you what, perform. That's the only way to outperform. Take the pain. Oh, just get used I to it. I think as a value guy, as a retail investor into value, what you got to know is that seventy to eighty percent of the time you're going to underperform, but over the full data set, you're going to outperform. Just Get that into your head. Think in terms of decades, like <clears throat> decades, plural, one decade, it turns out it's not enough. And then just know that you're gonna it's gonna suck for most of it. But yeah. over the full thing, you're gonna outperform. Comes back to being religious about it, right? It comes back to being sort it of is. a cellular a belief. Of faith where, in you, it, yeah. where you're gonna buy, you're gonna buy dollar, you know, two dollars for a dollar. You're gonna look for that all day long. You're going to ignore a lot of the volatility that that comes along with that. Um, however, whatever analogy that you want to use that's better than the analogies I used. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need weird monkish I'm going to pay for that, for that penalty comment. <laughs> oh, sure. my God. You are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hear about this every day for the rest of our lives. I feel um, like you don't get math. I don't understand. You're saying it, not for defending them. Um, <laughs> that's true.
Yeah. Well, look, I, like I've still got two thirds of a drink left, but I, we've been on here for about an hour and a quarter. So, I was going to ask. Yeah, we, but yeah, we got to we got to get on this Michael Green thing. I want like listen. I want to hear this conversation. I'm not because I know Adam. You had a conversation with him. He revealed some new charts. Uh, Toby's got some interesting. Let Let's end this on a high point. Everyone who's stuck around this far. <laughs> Let's give it. Is this really a high point? I don't know. Is this a high point for the value well, conversation? Well, Michael's it's, got, it's Michael's got two, let's let's talk. Michael's got let's two see. arguments. He's got one that he says that the flows into uh, indexes are so relentless and they're uh, they're not uh, price sensitive, and they drive out the price sensitive. Pl- the fundamental investors get driven out, and so that drives the index sort of. Uh, asymptotically parabolically to infinity and then it crashes um so that's a longer term trend of that's that's an, a longer term argument that he's been making on my podcast and other ones i don't really know it, it feels wrong to me but i can't kind of articulate exactly why i don't think it's going to play out like that he has another one that's more recent where he's and he's only two-thirds of the way through so we're sort of commentating before we get to the end but the argument is that Value. There's there's a problem with value, and I, and I fully don't understand. I haven't. I I need to see the final part of it before I kind of comment. I just don't. I I was trying to. I was coming to you guys to see if you could tell me what the what the argument was. I'm not sure that he exposed a a problem with value, other than he exposed a problem with price to book. But I think his decomposition was interesting, and I think he leaned pretty heavily into some of the research that Research Affiliates has been doing, where they demonstrate that. The vast majority, I want to say like north of 90% of the returns for value comes from stocks that migrate from the small value bucket into the large growth bucket, or even from the small value bucket into the small growth bucket. And there, there's a very a narrow segment of stocks that if you buy, if you just randomly buy the stocks in the small value bucket, there's a small percentage of stocks. I, I want to say maybe 4% of stocks that migrate from small value to small growth in any given period, call it a year. But those stocks rise at such a huge rate, they give like a 84% average return or something, that the probability weighted return on owning that stocks outweighs the essentially zero excess return on the rest of the, the small value basket. And then there's there's a you can then probability weight the potential for stocks to move from one basket to the other. And then small value investors are selling a call because when they move, when when the stocks move from the small value bucket to the large, to the small growth bucket, they will sell those stocks, right? So they're selling any further upside. So you're earning a premium on the the migration from small value to small mid, Uh small value to small growth, small value to to large values. So there's if you're a small value investor, you've got all of these different option premium that you're that you're buying. Large growth, or sorry, that you're selling. Large growth has a bunch of premium that you're buying, and there should be a negative premium. And it's just, I think, it's the logic uh, way of thinking about the problem as a as a set of different. You're selling and buying different optionality and getting paid based on the relative um, sum of those different optionalities. So. I think it's a, it's a, and, and that's just that paper. There's there's a huge amount of other dimensionality to their thesis, but I don't know. I thought it was an interesting framework. So I've, I just I've want to add, Adam, that we have that podcast that you had with uh, Green. It's up and live. So after you guys know? finish, oh, right it's now, already up. It's oh, already great. up. It's pun- It's published Almost one minute ago. ago. <laughs> one minute ago, it was published, and uh, so so uh, you know, Toby. <laughs> Uh, Wes, we'll have yeah. you back next week and we'll talk about it. Listen to it. Yeah, he covers some of that, what you were questioning in this podcast. So, oh, great. Oh, he I, covers I, a huge amount. It's, I kind of like the yeah. idea of, I mean, I'm not sure this, I haven't listened to it yet, but it seems to me that if the central banks are going to take out all of the, 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 the sort of the moral hazard of risk taking, it would seem to me that that would mean that the risk premium for equity markets would would be would disappear would become like a you know would would become like a a, a fixed income investment because you know you're going to get this excess return because you have you don't have this this uh, this hazard of risk taking it's been removed for you and thus the indexes would then rule and would crowd out all other financing which 
then well, how do you finance how, anything else? How does that how work for something? Japan? How's like value? I actually don't know. Values that. worked really well in Japan. Yeah, yeah that's study. So, I mean, that's a kind of. Um, it's yeah, a kind of argument there, right? 2011 study that I stuck up on Greenbacked way back in 2011, uh, and just like looking at simple price to ratios, that's that's been the only place to be in Japan. They've compounded their faces off over that full period. Yeah. To, Peter, to steal. Peter, Peter Kundal. Peter Kundal. Run 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 we're going to hear that today. Peter Kundal made his career with value stocks out of Japan through the 90s. I mean, crushed it. Made a built a whole firm on it. Yeah. Um, so it, it's it's interesting. Uh, I'm, I look forward to listening. Uh, probably about Japan and just thinking about uh, Green's argument is that you don't need to have stocks move out of small value to make money, right? Like Philip Morris has been a value stock classified for God knows how long, and it's probably one of the best performing stocks of all time. So you don't need to move and transition buckets. That's just like a nice to have. But, you know, if you buy with a higher carry in the form of higher dividend yield or what have you, like you still can outperform and you may not move anywhere. You could stay small value for a million years. Um, so I, I just think like anything, like it's just very complicated. And if, if I can't explain on a napkin anymore, I just don't believe it because I don't think anyone can really understand it. So I, I need to have I need to have a, a napkin drone up and, uh, and I'll believe it. Otherwise, I'm out. <laughs> That's all right. We've yeah. had this conversation lots of times. Yeah. <laughs> so here's my I, understand, I understand his argument that uh, it's short volatility. So he's saying you're, yeah. you're selling it. You're, I, I get that part of it is that part feels right to me. It's the it's the it's the next part that I don't fully understand the implications of of that. And then he says that the returns to value have been mischaracterized. I need to. I, I, I'm waiting for part three before I kind yeah. of. Well, let's, let's all read it and then come back and chat about it. Perfect. Yeah. I love it. Awesome, well, gentlemen. That seems like a, uh, a nice moment of pause. <laughs> and, uh, and now we can talk about sports. All right, uh, Rod, Adam. They're back. <laughs> Rod, football, Adam, Toby, football is go back. ahead, and Wes and I can talk about football and stuff. <laughs> what, what are Wes and I talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching MMA. That's been really good. I've been going back and watching all is the old back? fights. Well, I've been watching all the old fights on YouTube. That's, oh, the only, okay. that's the only kind of sport you can get these days. Yeah, yeah, me too. So have you heard about the NBA with the uh, with the Disney uh, shortened season? Eight games. Uh, they're all going to camp. 22 teams make it in. Yep. They're What's all camping Disney out at Disney. They're all playing at Disney. They'll be sort of sequestered that's into cool. the, uh, uh, the ESPN park at Disney. Oh, and uh, five games a day. They have to play one game back to back. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. The NHL is going to come up with something um, interesting as well. So, we'll see. so, so on, on the last note, we'll wrap up. What are you guys finding in, in this uh, uh, era of COVID? What are you finding that has been a, a pleasant surprise um, as you've been, as you've been kind of navigating this for, for me, it's been um, the idea of we, we get together on the resolve team. We play a little poker together in the evening and, not a big game or anything, but we talk about all the all the topics of the day, and uh, and then also we've got a little D and D game going with uh, with some folks out there. So, bit of a fantasy role player kind of guy, and uh, as weird as that may sound, probably fits my personality. Um, so, so those are the things that that I've kind of come across that have been really interesting and novel and new that I've reengaged in. What about you guys? Yeah, I've been catching up with friends from Australia. It's been great. Like I. I don't know why I wasn't doing it beforehand. Just I, I know that everybody's home, so we. I've been doing Skype beers uh, similar to this one. I've, I've got one in about an hour, so well, I'll finally be able to have a beer, finish the finish the work day off, and have a beer. That's been great, and having the kids around's actually been really fun too. Yeah, that's amazing, and everyone's everyone's healthy. All the kids are healthy, and the families are healthy. I'm assuming. Yeah, across no coronavirus the here. Perfect. How about you, Wes? Uh, you know, for me, honestly, this kind of sounds cheese ball, but, uh, I, I actually just became in more in love with my wife. Cause like we have to hang out all the time and she's like managing the kids and like, you know, I'm just, like, speaker, and I just get to hang out in my cave and work. Um, it's so actually texted me about that. That's why we're not talking as much yeah, so yeah, yeah, I just with you about uh, that. <laughs> you know, much more appreciative of, uh, you know, I was all obviously already appreciative, but I just, you know, I just, I just really came to, I got even more tribal, man. I just like, I love my family even more than I liked them before. 
uh, which is, you know, I think it's a great thing from the, from the event. Adam, isn't that, isn't that great when they're like this pre-teenage years? It's just enjoy it. <laughs> enjoy it. I, I have, I have like 20 somethings now. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have fun with that. <laughs> you know, I, I'm in a sweet spot, man. I'm five to yeah. eleven. I don't got any. Uh, yeah, you're 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 in a place. Don't worry. Yeah, I'm in a good spot right now. <laughs> By the way, honey, I know you're listening live. I feel the exact same way that Wes does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wes is Wes. Just so Fortunately, you know. like 95% of the people listening to this are, are men. So, <laughs> and the other, so the other, the right other 5% now. are trying to decide. They're, 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 right. just trying, they're in the other five groups. Have you seen the YouTube breakdowns of these are always pretty great. Like mine's, mine's about the same. It's like 95% blokes, like, Three percent female, two percent non-binder, not non-gender binary, non-binary gender. I, I was like, that's that's great. Yeah. I've got a really diverse podcast. I'm happy with that. We, we also just did you a know, breakdown. It's, it's nice to be targeted. I, I know, I know a couple of guys who've transitioned over, so it's been all oh, to 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 girls. So it's great. There's quite a, like the value community has a few. I'm I'm proud of the value community. Double diversity. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. I, we also like. I have. I'm 25 minutes late to my. Um, uh, I, I, college buddies poker game right now so we gotta, we gotta okay, wrap this up now. let's wrap yeah, what, butler what are you are you did you anything come come to anything new butler besides your, your stuff we covered last can't week? wait we got our D D campaign tonight at 8 30 yeah. you know it's uh i gotta settle in i gotta cook some lamb burgers and um then check into the game yeah, yeah. You, and, and you should uh everyone should should text us and guess what character butler is and and uh what class and uh, race i am it'd be funny what would anyway, I, 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 I kind of want to can't know. disclose now or the pizza <laughs> I, I mean, it would, it does. Yeah. Well, Toby, give us your guess. Oh, I'd say, I'd say, uh, Fulbrick's like, you're a mage or something like that. And I'm going to say, Butler's a uh, barbarian. What? Stop it. He knows. <laughs> He's not going to glory for sure. Is that true? Awesome. 100%. I'm a warlock. I'm, I'm a I'm a celestial yeah. warlock. You are yeah. awesome. You are There's right. no way you have to talk to Corey. I didn't know. I 100 did not That's know. That's inside yeah. baseball. That's because I think that in real life, Philbrick is a barbarian, and you're a, you're a wizard. You're a wizard. <laughs> <laughs> so of course you're playing against type when you're playing the game. I love it. See that is too that derivative. derivative. That's inside right, right there. That's minimum. Minimum. Yeah. That's minimum. Yeah. I'm, that's why we have you guys. A good I'm checking with Corey, here. though, to make sure that you guys haven't already not, been on this. Have not. <laughs> All right, All gentlemen. Right, that was Corey, a real you know, pleasure. Uh, I got to yeah, tell you, I really awesome. enjoyed catching up in the chin wag. I miss you guys, and I uh, can't wait to see you in 3D at some point in the future. Yeah, that's fun. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, thanks, Take it easy, guys. See you guys. See ya.